First, we would like to thank the European Being Society and all the volunteers who helped out this, with this event. Without all their hard work, this event would not be possible. We would also like to thank our speakers for taking time out of their busy schedule to debate on such an important topic. Lastly, we thank you, the audience, for joining us tonight to consider the significant question, Does God Exist? With that, let me introduce our speakers. Our distinguished philosophers are Professor Dr. Ron D'Souza, arguing in the negative, and Professor Dr. William Lane Craig, arguing in the affirmative. Dr. Ron D'Souza is a Professor Emeritus of Philosophy at the University of Toronto. He has lectured in over 20 countries on emotions, evolutionary theory, cognitive science, sexuality, and religious belief. He has authored books such as The Rationality of Emotion and Why Think Evolution and the Rational Mind, and over 100 articles in a variety of periodicals and books. Dr. William Lane Craig is a research professor of philosophy at Talbot School of Theology in La Mirada, California. He and his wife, Jan, have two grown children. He has authored and edited over 30 books, including, including The Kalam Cosmological Argument, Assessing the New Testament Evidence for the Historicity of the Resurrection of Jesus, Divine Foreknowledge and Human Freedom, Theism, Atheism, and Big Bang Cosmology, and God, Time, and Eternity, as well as over 100 articles in professional journals of philosophy and theology, including the Journal of Philosophy, New Testament Studies, American Philosophical Quarterly, and Philosophical Studies. If you'd like to find out more about what he does, he has a website. It's www.reasonablefaith.org. Please join me in welcoming both of our speakers. Jeremy Larkins from the York Debate Society. He will explain the rules and the format of the debate. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Is this mic better? Yes. Okay. I thought so. Yeah, I was going to use that one, but it sounded a bit scratchy. Sorry, Ari. Um, okay, so I'll very briefly go over the format of the debate you're going to be seeing tonight. Uh, so at the beginning, uh, each speaker, starting with Dr. Craig for the affirmative, will have uh, 20 minutes to open up the presentation of their case and their arguments. Uh, during that 20 minute period, we would ask that the speakers uh, not make mention of the other speaker's position, so essentially no head start on the rebuttal. So we'll see 20 minutes from each side. Uh, then there will be a time, there will be a rebuttal period after that 20 minutes. Each speaker will again have uh, an eight minute opportunity to engage with the arguments of their opponent. Uh, afterwards, there will be a five minute dialogue period during which time the speaker will actually have an opportunity to ask questions directly uh, to the opposing speaker, and that speaker will have one minute to answer the questions being asked. Uh, so that those one minute answering periods will be included in the total five minute uh, cross-examination time. Finally, there will be uh, 10 minutes for closing remarks, then there will be a uh, five minute opportunity for the audience to fill out comment cards, and then we will be having questions from the audience, which I think we'll be explaining later, uh, or when that time comes. You won't be hearing from me again for a while, unless the debaters really get out of hand. Uh, there, there will be a timekeeper at the front displaying them uh, time cards to let them know that they have 10 minutes, five minutes, one minute left. Uh, so, I'm um, confident they shouldn't have too much difficulty staying with it. Uh, be a lot of time. So, without further ado, um, I would like Dr. Craig to start. Here. Well, good evening. Uh, let me begin by expressing my thanks for the invitation to participate in tonight's debate. Dr. D'Souza and I have actually debated before, and so I think I can confidently predict that we're in for a very uh, enlightening and, I think, entertaining evening. Now, in tonight's debate, I'm going to defend two basic contentions. One, there is no good reason to think that atheism is true. And two, there are good reasons to think that theism is true. 
Consider then my first contention, that there's no good reason to think that atheism is true. Atheists have tried for centuries to disprove the existence of God, but no one's come up with a successful argument. So rather than attack straw men at this point, I'll just wait for Dr. D'Souza to present his arguments against God's existence, and then I'll respond to them in my next speech. In the meantime, then, let's turn to my second main contention, that there are good reasons to think that theism is true. However unfashionable it may seem, I'm persuaded that there really are good reasons to believe that God exists. Let me sketch briefly just some of those reasons. Number one, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Have you ever asked yourself where the universe came from? Why everything exists instead of just nothing? Typically, atheists have said that the universe is just eternal, and that's all. But there are good reasons, both philosophically and scientifically, to doubt that this is the case. Philosophically, the idea of an infinite past seems absurd. Just think about it. If the universe never had a beginning, that means that the number of events in the past history of the universe is infinite. But mathematicians recognize that the existence of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. For example, what is infinity minus infinity? Well, mathematically, you get self-contradictory answers. This shows that infinity is just an idea in your mind, not something that exists in reality. David Hilbert, perhaps the greatest mathematician of the 20th century, wrote, the infinite is nowhere to be found in reality. It neither exists in nature, nor provides a legitimate basis for rational thought. The role that remains for the infinite to play is solely that of an idea. But that entails that since past events are not just ideas but are real, the number of past events must be <coughs> finite. Therefore, the series of past events cannot go back forever. Rather, the universe must have begun to exist. This conclusion has been confirmed by remarkable discoveries in astronomy and astrophysics. In one of the most startling developments of modern science, we now have pretty strong evidence that the universe is not eternal in the past, but had an absolute beginning about 13 billion years ago in a cataclysmic event known as the Big Bang. What makes the Big Bang so startling is that it represents the origin of the universe from literally nothing. For all matter and energy, even physical space and time themselves, came into being at the Big Bang. As the physicist PCW Davies explains, the coming into being of the universe, as discussed in modern science, is not just a matter of imposing some sort of organization upon a previous incoherent state, but literally the coming into being of all physical things from nothing. Now, of course, alternative theories have been proposed over the years to try to avoid this absolute beginning. <coughs> But none of these theories has commended itself to the scientific community as more probable than the Big Bang Theory. In fact, in 2003, Arvind Bohr, Alan Guth, and Alexander Vilenkin were able to prove that any universe which is, on average, in a state of cosmic expansion cannot be eternal in the past, but must have an absolute beginning. Vilenkin pulls no punches. He writes, it is said that an argument is what convinces reasonable men, and a proof is what it takes to convince even an unreasonable man. With the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There is no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. That problem was nicely captured by Anthony Kennedy of Oxford University. He writes, a proponent of the Big Bang Theory, at least if he is an atheist, must believe that the universe came from nothing and by nothing. But surely that doesn't make sense.
For such a conclusion is, in the words of philosopher of science, Baron of Königscheider, in head-on collision with the most successful ontological commitment in the history of science, namely, the metaphysical principle that out of nothing, nothing comes. So, why does the universe exist instead of just nothing? Where did it come from? There must have been a cause which brought the universe into being. And we can summarize our argument thus far as follows. Premise one, whatever begins to exist has a cause. Two, the universe began to exist. Three, therefore, the universe has a cause. Now, as the cause of space and time, this being must be an uncaused, timeless, spaceless, immaterial being of unfathomable power. Moreover, it must be personal as well. Why? Because this cause must be beyond space and time. Therefore, it cannot be physical or material. Now, there are only two kinds of things that fit that description. Either an abstract object, like a number, or else an intelligent mind. But abstract objects can't cause anything. Therefore, it follows that the cause of the universe is a transcendent personal mind. Number two. God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. In recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine-tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a delicacy and precision that literally defy human comprehension. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Second, in addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities which are simply put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy or the balance between matter and antimatter in the early universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the life-permitting balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. For example, if the force of gravity or the atomic weak force were altered by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power, the universe would not have been life permitting. Now, there are only three possible explanations of this extraordinary fine tuning, either physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because, as we've seen, the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. In fact, string theory predicts that there are around 10 to the 500th power different possible universes compatible with nature's laws. So could the fine-tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with this alternative is that the odds against the fine-tunings occurring by accident are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. The probability that all of the constants and quantities should fall by chance alone into the life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe. So, if the universe were a product of chance, the odds are overwhelming that the universe should be life-prohibiting. Hence, we may argue as follows. One, the fine-tuning of the universe is due to either physical necessity, chance, or design. Two, it is not due to either physical necessity or chance. Three, therefore, it is due to design. 
Thus, the fine-tuning of the universe implies the existence of a designer of the cosmos. Three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values in the world. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. By objective moral values, I mean moral values which are valid and binding, whether we believe in them or not. Many theists and atheists agree that if God does not exist, then moral values are not objective in that way. Michael Roos, a noted philosopher of science, explains, The position of the modern evolutionist, he writes, is that morality is a biological adaptation, no less than our hands and feet and teeth. Considered as a rationally justifiable set of claims about an objective something, ethics is illusory. I appreciate that when somebody says, love thy neighbor as thyself, they think they are referring above and beyond themselves. Nevertheless, such reference is truly without foundation. Morality is just an aid to survival and reproduction, and any deeper meaning is illusory. Like Professor Roos, I just don't see any reason to think that in the absence of God, the morality evolved by Homo sapiens is objective. On the atheistic view, some actions, say rape, may not be socially advantageous, and so in the course of human development has become taboo. But that does absolutely nothing to prove that rape is really wrong. On the atheistic view, there's nothing really wrong with your raping someone. But the problem is that objective values do exist, and deep down, I think we all know it. In moral experience, we apprehend a realm of objective moral goods and evils. Actions like rape, cruelty, and child abuse aren't just socially unacceptable behavior. They're moral abominations. Some things are really wrong. Roos himself admits the man who says it is morally acceptable to rape little children is just as mistaken as the man who says two plus two equals five. Similarly, love, equality, and self-sacrifice are really good. There's no more reason to deny the objective reality of moral values than the objective reality of the physical world. So, our argument can be summarized as follows. Premise one. If God does not exist, then objective moral values do not exist. Two, but objective values do exist, from which it follows logically and inescapably that three, therefore, God exists. Number four, the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus imply God's existence. The historical person, Jesus of Nazareth, was a remarkable individual. Historians have reached something of a consensus that Jesus came on the scene with an unprecedented sense of divine authority, the authority to stand and speak in God's place. He claimed that in himself the kingdom of God had come, and his visible demonstrations of this fact he carried out in ministry of miracles and exorcisms. But the supreme confirmation of his claim was his resurrection from the dead. If Jesus really did rise from the dead, then it would seem that we have a divine miracle on our hands and thus evidence for the existence of God. Now, most people would probably think that the resurrection of Jesus is something you just believe in by faith or not. But there are actually three established facts recognized by the majority of historians today which I believe are best explained by the resurrection of Jesus. Fact number one, on the Sunday after his crucifixion, Jesus' tomb was found empty by a group of his women followers. According to Jakob Kramer, an Austrian specialist in the study of the resurrection, by far most scholars hold firmly to the reliability of the biblical statements about the empty tomb. Fact number two, on separate occasions, different individuals and groups saw appearances of Jesus alive after his death. According to the prominent New Testament critic Gerald Ludemann, 
It may be taken as historically certain that the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. These appearances were witnessed not only by believers, but also by unbelievers, skeptics, and even enemies. Fact number three, the original disciples suddenly came to believe in the resurrection of Jesus despite every predisposition to the contrary. Jews had no belief in a dying, much less rising, Messiah. And Jewish beliefs about the afterlife precluded anyone's rising from the dead to immortality before the end of the world. Nevertheless, the original disciples came to believe so strongly that God had raised Jesus from the dead that they were willing to go to their deaths in attestation to this belief. N.T. Wright, an eminent New Testament scholar, concludes, that is why, as an historian, I cannot explain the rise of early Christianity unless Jesus rose again, leaving an empty tomb behind him. Attempts to explain away these three great facts, uh, like the disciples stole the body, or Jesus wasn't really dead, have been universally rejected among contemporary scholarship. The simple fact is that there just is no plausible, naturalistic explanation of these three facts. And therefore, it seems to me that Christian is amply justified in believing that Jesus rose from the dead and was who he claimed to be. But that entails that God exists. And thus, we have a good inductive argument for the existence of God based on the resurrection of Jesus. Premise one, there are three established facts concerning the fate of Jesus, his uh, empty tomb, his post-mortem appearances, and the origin of the disciples' belief in his resurrection. Two, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead is the best explanation of these facts. Three, the hypothesis God raised Jesus from the dead entails that the God revealed by Jesus exists. Four, therefore, the God revealed by Jesus exists. Finally, number five, God can be personally known and experienced. This isn't really an argument for God's existence. Rather, it's the claim that you can know that God exists wholly apart from arguments simply by personally experiencing him. This was the way people in the Bible knew God. As Professor John Hick explains, God was known to them as a dynamic will interacting with their own wills, a sheer given reality as inescapably to be reckoned with as destructive storm and life-giving sunshine. To them, God was not an idea adopted by the mind, but an experienced reality which gave significance to their lives. Now, if this is so, then there's a real danger that arguments for God could actually distract our attention from God himself. If you're sincerely seeking God, then God will make his existence evident to you. The Bible promises, draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. We mustn't so focus on the external arguments that we fail to hear the inner voice of God speaking to our own hearts. For those who listen, God becomes an immediate reality in their lives. In conclusion then, we've seen five good reasons to think that God exists. One, God is the best explanation of the origin of the universe. Two, God is the best explanation of the fine-tuning of the universe for intelligent life. Three, God is the best explanation of objective moral values in the world. Four, God is the best explanation of the historical facts concerning the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. And five, God can be personally known and experienced. If Dr. D'Souza wants us to believe that God does not exist, then he must first tear down all five of the reasons that I've presented, and then in their place erect a case of his own to prove that God does not exist. Unless, and until he does that, I think that belief in God is the more plausible worldview.
what um, Professor Craig has suggested, but I'm not allowed to do it now, because I had to promise not to anticipate any of his arguments, and of course, since I hadn't heard them, um, that was easy to do, except accidentally. And accidents, of course, are indeed very important. What I will do, in fact, is give you four reasons against God, not just against the existence of God, but four reasons for thinking that the question is either meaningless or has a clearly negative answer. First of all, that everything that you need God to, to explain, you can explain without Him. Secondly, that when you want to believe rationally, you must not be preoccupied with comfort or what, it's, what it seems right, uh, but only with what's true. Thirdly, that as a matter of fact, the God of the Bible is an evil bully. <laughs> Fourthly, that life is in fact far grander and more wonderful and more beautiful if you get rid of this ancient primitive hypothesis. Let's start then with a kind of inversion, the classic proof. I couldn't attribute it to Professor Craig, even if I thought he'd go to use it because I wasn't allowed to, but I'm actually going to show you that the very definition of God entails that God does not exist. Why? Well, God, on this classic proof, is that being that which no greater can be conceived. Now, if you're comparing two things and one can do all kinds of things uh, without needing some help, then that one is stronger than the other one who needs some sort of help. Now, therefore, if God existed, you could imagine a God even bigger than that one, the God who wouldn't even need to exist in order to do all these wonderful things. Well, maybe you think this is a joke. You haven't read much theology if you think theologians are not capable of arguments that sound very much like that. But, in fact, there is a theological argument that says that you can't apply any predicates to God because being infinite, he is so much above anything you can dream that God is not good, God is not great, God is not kind. He's something else altogether and no words can convey. You only have to add this one thing, so God does not exist either. Okay, but really what matters is that Indeed, people have always believed in gods. And then they decided too many was too many, and so they believed in just two, that was many years. And then they said, oh, well, why, why two? Let's just have one. In fact, let's have one who's just perfect and wonderful. And that was an obvious, that was an obvious reaction to the awfulness of life, to the fact that the gods are so vicious that they've spent that the, that the entire history of the world is a history of carnage. So, scary guy, God, let's pretend we think he's nice and maybe he'll be a little nicer than us. Now, in fact, I think that science and religion, at first, are not opposed. Both come from exactly the same roots in two respects. In respect of their emotional and in respect of their explanatory nature. The emotions that are likely to be generated by looking at the world are that if there is a God, he's capricious, cruel, and very scary. Right? If you find it scary, then it might be a good idea to say, well, no, no, actually, there's a really nice one. And he's going to be the answer to all these problems. But the scientific approach is to say, well, actually, it's more beautiful, if you think of it, as just being due to random events, to chance and necessity, without any intelligent designer. Now, you're told in the Bible that God cares about every single thing. The hairs of your head are numbered. But actually, the idea that nothing happens without a reason, which I think is a very strong motive for believing in God, is in fact incoherent. Most things are random for most purposes. Here's the proof. Here's the proof. Think about any act. I lift my arm, I drink a cup of tea, doesn't matter what. It has an infinity of consequences. 
or if there are no actual infinities, it has something that's practically infinite. But no agent can have an infinity of intentions. Therefore, in relation to your intentions, most things that happen are random. Now, does this apply to God? Well, you can say yes, or you can say no. Leibniz said yes. Leibniz said, this is the best of all possible worlds. Think about it. It's a very gloomy idea. This is the best of all possible worlds. How depressing. I mean, you couldn't even get better than this. But at least it's an excuse for God. It's an excuse for all the things that are truly awful in this world. He didn't mean to. He just did the best he could. On the other hand, God is supposed to be omnipotent. If God is omnipotent, then I'm afraid that if he can intend every single one of this infinite number of consequences, he is responsible for all the awful things that happen in the world. Horrible pain for millions of innocents, animals just carnage over millions of years, just for the fun, just for the fun of God. Now, in respect to explanations, what science and religion have in common is that both are looking for explanations for what we can see, what we can observe, in terms of what cannot be observed. So, two alternatives, gods and spirits, or things like atoms, forces, fields, general laws of nature. Now, the fact is that, as I've just suggested, most things do not happen for a reason. And that when you think about why things happen, God is exactly as unpredictable as chance. What a coincidence. But what's going to happen? Well, you know, you can pray, and God is going to do three things. One of three things. Say yes, say no, or say maybe. And the fact is, it's totally unpredictable. Well, that's what we call chance. So to call it God is completely vacuous. In fact, evolution has equipped us with what somebody called a hyperactive agency detection device. That is to say that whatever happens, we have a very strong tendency to think that must have been done on purpose. Hence the god of thunder, hence the god of floods, hence all of these nasty gods, each of whom is responsible for one or the other of the awful things that happens in life. In other words, this native tendency that we have gives rise to illusions of agency outside ourselves. And science has succeeded only insofar as it has completely rejected this idea of agency as an explanation for what happens in favor of looking for mechanisms. Now, religion is just a shortcut to explanation in terms of one or more super agents. But in fact, it is no explanation whatsoever. It is just to say, I don't know why this happened. Oh yes, I do. It was God. Ah, oh, okay. Now I know. Okay? Now, there is a, I think, very strong motive, apart from the, hyper, uh, the, the, the hyperactive agency detection device, to think that God is a comfort. That God, belief in God, is a good thing because it makes you feel better. And maybe because you can avoid hell, since after all God has threatened you with hell if you don't believe. I'll come to that in a moment. But in fact, this makes three difficulties for religion. One is that the fact is that the something is comforting is no reason whatever to think that it is true. Unfortunately, that's just not the case. If I have cancer, you know, I may feel better if I believe that I just got a cold, but it won't make it true. Secondly, most people's religious beliefs are, despite the fact that some people, like Dr. Craig, think they have lots of arguments for it, they're in fact determined entirely by where you were born and who your parents were, were and what they believed. Now, in that case, your beliefs are totally random, in effect in relation to whatever might be the truth. Furthermore, religious beliefs notoriously contradict one another. There are at least a thousand sects of so-called Christians. And there are at least 20 major religion, religions in the world in, within which there are a whole lot of sects, most of which think that all the others are going to go to hell. Okay? So now, religion, of course, ignores these difficulties 
because it's very difficult to think straight about these things. And I certainly commend anybody, any theologian who attempts to do it. So I have a great deal of respect for that. But I think for most people, almost by definition, probably not you since you're here, but most people who believe do not want to make the effort to think about it. It's difficult. Furthermore, we are subject to something that is psychologically extremely well established called confirmation bias, which means that we only notice those observations that confirm what we already believe. And we simply ignore those that do not. Okay? So, for example, is prayer effective? Well, when you actually test it, it turns out that it's not. Although some guy in the 19th century called Bolton tried it, he found that people who have prayed for a lot tended to die slightly sooner. Uh, actually, the that God took them to his bosom earlier because of all the prayers. But it doesn't really after they were praying for his life, not his death, so, you know. The fact is that prayer is a placebo. That is to say, it's like a sugar pill that has no chemical effect, but when it works, you think it works because of its chemical effect. We ignore cases where it doesn't work. Fourth, thirdly, the God of the Bible is indeed an evil bully. I might as well say it straight. And there's four, four headings under this general rubric. God cannot define what is good. And I'm sorry, I, I, I suppose I did anticipate the, uh, one of the points, but, but I'm going to put it entirely positively. Uh, God condones evil, God promises and boasts of perpetrating the most awful evil, and gratitude to God is morally despicable. Okay, why can God's command not define what is good? Well, imagine if God commanded, if God commanded you to torture babies, and if God commanded you to rape them, just to take those examples, would you accept that? No, and therefore what God commands is irrelevant to what you think is good. Furthermore, in practice, the God of the Bible did condone or command all kinds of horrible things, as a matter of fact, including rape. If you remember the story of the chap who pushed out his daughter to all these people who were about to rape his guests, his male guests, so that his daughter would be raped instead. Nice thing. God just wanted the right person to be raped. Okay? So, if you think of all the horrible things God has done, sacrifice of Isaac, please kill your son, and at the last moment, they go, oh, here's a goat. Okay? Um, this is, this is uh, slavery. Nowhere in the Bible is slavery ever condemned. So no one can say, I know slavery is wrong because it says so in the Bible. It does not say so in the Bible. Not in the New Testament or the Old Testament. Okay, forced marriage, perfectly common. Killing your child for mere disobedience is what you're supposed to do. And remember that Christ says, I'm not bringing a new law. It's the old law that you know. That includes such things. Genocide and revenge for offenses of the few, etc. In Revelation, the speaker says, Thou, Lord, hast created all things for thy pleasure. Sorry, Miss Prince. Okay, what? What has he created for his pleasure? Tsunamis, volcanic, volcanic eruptions, suffering, endless suffering of innocent animals and people, just for his pleasure. Furthermore, now this is where, of course, my personal interest comes in, I appeal to your moral sense. He says, he that believeth not shall be damned. That's me. Do you really think I deserve eternal damnation and hellfire just because I can't bring myself to bring to believe these old wives' tales? Now, furthermore, given the dependence that we've seen on the location of your birth, of, uh, of, of what you believe, it means that God has been totally random in assigning some to be damned and some to be saved. You're born over here, you'll be saved. You're born over there, wrong parents, sorry, hard luck, you're damned forever. <laughs> now, the point about gratitude is this. Let me tell you a true story. There was a, there was a plane crash some years ago, and, and, and 
20 people, I think it was 50 people were saved and 50 people died. For technical reasons, they interviewed someone who had and survived. <laughs> and that person said, now I know that God exists. What about the other fuckers? <laughs> now, you know, I mean, I think that, I think that, that is, there's only two ways in which this person could have thought of it. He could have said, well, I, of course, deserve to be saved by the creator of the universe, the artificer of the Big Bang, pointed to me and said, he deserves, he deserves. <laughs> and the others, let's kill those, right? Well, really, can you condone this? Or maybe it was just totally random. That's called grace in theology. Completely arbitrary. I think the concept of grace is a great concept, actually, because it, it acknowledges, it's, it's religious people acknowledging that as a matter of fact, everything that matters is deeply random. But then you can hardly say that God cares about fairness. All of this basically amounts to the classic argument from evil. God is omniscient, he knows everything, he is omnibenevolent, he's all good, he is omnipotent, and therefore he can do anything. So why doesn't God prevent evil? As clearly, manifestly, observation shows that he doesn't. Of course, you can tell a story about how it's all going to come out all right in the end, right? But you have to swallow the whole story for that even to make sense. And since there's so much compelling evidence that we will not survive our death, that no one can have a consciousness and experience pleasure or pain once their brain has dissolved into dust or ashes, right? This promised land where everything's going to be all right is clearly just a fairy tale. Finally, I want you to consider the possibility and I know this is going to be incredibly hard for those of you who believe. But I think quite easy for those who don't. And maybe for some of you who are just on the edge, that you'll be able to see that actually, life is a lot better without God. First of all, you can have all the good things that God brings you. As indeed the Greeks, the Chinese, the Indians had all the good things in terms of deathless art, in terms of wonderful literature brought to them by gods who, as I said at the beginning, didn't need to exist in order to bring them all these goods. Okay? So you can have everything without God. You can have art and use all those gods as metaphors and not just be confined to one. You can pursue mystical states. Mystical states are perfectly intelligible. We can recognize them for states that go with certain conditions of the brain. We can cultivate them by uh, all kinds of techniques, which may include meditation, may include drugs. It doesn't matter. The point is that mystical states in no way require that you should believe in God. Even though, of course, those who believe in God attribute their mystical states to some sort of personal experience of God himself. And above all, not only can you still be a good person and seek justice and fight against cruelty and harmful prejudices without God, but I submit you're a lot more likely to. And there's evidence about that as well. For example, the simple evidence, it's very well known, that in the God-fearing states of the United States, the so-called red states, there are a lot more rapes, there are a lot more murders, there are a lot more teenage pregnancies than there are the so-called blue states, where fewer people uh, believe this stuff. So, I will conclude, despite the fact that I still have over 30 seconds in which I could spatiate on something to say, by suggesting to you that if the God of God is the place where the very fact of wanting knowledge Eating the fruit of the tree of knowledge is a mortal sin that we've had to pay for ever since. And that God had to torture himself in order to expatiate. What kind of a story is that? We're well out of that God. Thank you.
You'll remember that in my first speech, I said I would defend two main contentions in tonight's debate. The first of which was that there's no good reason to think that atheism is true. Now, in his opening speech, uh, Dr. D'Souza, I think, could get a prize for rhetoric if we were competing in that. Uh, but it's very difficult to discern exactly his arguments because the premises of his arguments weren't very clearly presented. But I discerned basically five arguments in that opening speech against the existence of God. Let me attempt to respond to these as best I can. Number one, the definition of God entails that he doesn't exist. And here he does a parody of the ontological argument. The ontological argument is an argument that says that as the greatest conceivable being, God would exist in all possible worlds. So that if God's existence is even possible, it follows that he exists in all possible worlds and therefore in the actual world. I think the ontological argument is a sound argument for the existence of God, and so I'm going to add it to the five that I've already presented. But what Dr. D'Souza says is, uh, we can parody this by saying there's an even greater God than the God of the ontological argument, namely a God who doesn't exist and who manages to create everything. The problem with that is that a God who doesn't exist is a logical incoherence. It is logically self-contradictory to say there is a being which does not exist. There is no possible world which contains a being that doesn't exist. And therefore, this isn't parallel to the ontological argument. It is, in fact, a logical incoherence which does nothing to show either that the ontological argument is unsound or that God does not exist. Second argument that he suggests uh, seems to be the argument from evil and imperfection in the world. And here I need to correct a misimpression. The theist is not committed to the view that this is the best of all possible worlds. Leibniz may have held that, but almost no other theist believes that. Indeed, the idea of a best of all possible worlds may be a logically incoherent idea. The scale of possible worlds may simply go on without any sort of maximum value. You could always add uh, better things and get better and better so that God is simply required to create a world that is on balance good. It may be a logical incoherence to talk about the best of all possible worlds. In any case, if Dr. D'Souza is maintaining that there's some sort of a logical contradiction between the propositions God exists and evil and suffering exist, then he, is up, he spares the burden of proof of showing that contradiction. Those are not explicitly contradictory. If the atheist wants to say they're implicitly contradictory, then he must be assuming some hidden premises that would bring out that contradiction and make it explicit. But no atheist has ever been able to successfully identify what those hidden premises are. So I will simply wait for Dr. Seuss's response. In fact, I can actually prove that those are compatible by adding a third premise, namely, God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil that exists. As long as that's even possible, it shows that God and evil are not logically incompatible. So the atheist would have to show that it is impossible for God to have morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil in the world, and that's an enormous burden of proof that no atheist has ever been able to bear. The third argument that he gives is a cluster of arguments that are united by their common commission of the genetic fallacy, namely the argument that religious belief is due to a hyperactive agency detection advice that God is a comfort and that you, uh, where you were born determines what you believe. All of these commit the genetic fallacy which tries to invalidate a belief by showing how the belief originated. And that, as he knows, is simply a logical fallacy. The fact is, we still have to ask ourselves what justification is there for these beliefs, and that is independent of how the belief came to originate. The fourth argument is a cluster of arguments against the, the God of the Bible, even though that isn't the topic tonight. He says that, uh, first, God cannot be the source of moral values because then the good will be arbitrary. Not at all. I maintain that the good is the essential nature of God. God is, by nature, loving just, kind, compassionate, and so forth. And that this nature expresses itself to us in the form of divine commandments, which constitute our moral duties. So his commandments are not arbitrary, but necessary expressions of his essential nature. By contrast, as I argued in my opening speech on the naturalist view, there are no objective moral values. There is no right and wrong. Morality is just a spin-off of the sociobiological process. 
and you cannot condemn Nazism, discrimination, apartheid as objectively wrong because in an atheistic world, right and wrong do not exist. He then raises a number of biblical issues without citing the text, without any serious attempt to do any exegesis. For example, the story of Lot's daughters being offered to the crowd to rape. God didn't command that. That was Lot's own initiative. There's nothing in that narrative that suggests that that was commanded by God. Is slavery condemned in the New Testament? Yes, it is. In the uh, book of 1 Timothy, it condemns slave trading as being contrary to God's will. In these other cases that he mentions, he makes no serious attempt to, to look at them in their historical context. He did not lay down general moral principles. They were highly contingent, historically conditioned incidents, which have nothing to do with a sort of general moral principle. He says, well, uh, is hell uh, deserving of those who do not believe? I would say in one sense, God sends nobody to hell. Rather, we separate ourselves from God irrevocably by refusing his grace and his forgiveness. And therefore, he has no choice but to give us what we deserve. It is we who determine where we will spend eternity, either by embracing God's forgiveness or by spurning his grace and love and irrevocably separating ourselves from him forever. So much for the biblical arguments. The fifth argument is that life is better without God. Now I thought, who is arguing from wish fulfillment? To the truth of his view, it is Dr. D'Souza who is saying now, life is better without God, so let's live as atheists. This is uh, appealing to atheism based on comfort. But I would say, in fact, there are lots of things that you lose uh, if God does not exist. You lose objective meaning in life. Life becomes absurd. There is no objective meaning to life. You lose objective value in life, as I emphasized in my opening speech. Uh, human beings are just animals, and animals are not moral agents. There is no moral right and wrong. You lose objective purpose in life. The petty plans and projects that you develop for your life are just illusory. They are not objectively the purpose of your life. They're just things you make up. So I think you lose a lot of God doesn't exist. And then he says, you're more likely to be good if uh, you're an atheist than a theist. That is demonstrably false based on sociological studies. I have here a review of the book, Who Really Cares, by Arthur C. Brooks, which shocked people by showing that religious people are vastly more charitable, volunteer more, give blood more often, volunteer more often than do secular people. In fact, uh, Brooks' uh, studies completely explode the idea of the uh, myth of the secular humanist who is uh, good. The fact is that it is sociologically demonstrable that it is religious people who are the ones who are the most charitable, who volunteer the most, who give the most of their time for the homeless and the poor. So it is simply patently false that you're more likely to be good if you are an atheist. Okay, so uh, thank you very much. Um, it, um, um, I now want to come to some of the arguments in the initial presentation, and I hope that I'll have time to go back to the various uh, counter-arguments that uh, Dr. Greg presented. Now, um, obviously I can't do it all, but I think it's important to show that the uh, issue of origins of the universe and the claim that God is the best explanation is completely spurious for several reasons. First of all, I repeat what I just said a moment ago, which is that to say that you have an explanation for something, and then to say my explanation is God, is actually simply to use a word that has absolutely no content whatsoever. People used to think that they had an explanation called God for lightning, for floods, for a disease, for everything that happened in your life. And the whole point of, if you grant that there's been some improvement uh, since the Dark Ages, uh, the whole point of what has led to this improvement is precisely that people have said, wait a minute, to say that God did it is to say absolutely nothing. The only thing that allows you to understand something is to give some sort of mechanism. Now, if, do we have a mechanism for the Big Bang? No, we do not, nor do I claim that we do. 
But it is completely spurious to say, just because we don't know what caused it, it must have been God. It begs the question, and it's completely backwards. Now, there were a number of truly fallacious arguments Dr. Craig presented that had to do with infinity. First of all, the idea that there's no actual infinity attributed to most mathematicians is completely wrong. All you have to do is to take a stretch from one my left finger to my right finger, and you will see that there is, just in that stretch, an actual infinity of points. This is a problem. This gives rise to a problem that uh, Zeno worried about, and that worried everybody until uh, people finally figured out that actually it wasn't a problem after all, precisely because you can allow that there is an actual infinity there. Now, whether the, whether the, the, um, the world needs to be finite because you can't have an actual infinity is in any case um, something which the argument doesn't show at all. Why? Because there's a difference between being boundless and being truly infinite. As many of you, I'm sure, know, in geometry you can have a space that is completely without an edge, and yet which is finite in extent. For example, the surface of a sphere is such that you can never get to the end. If you're a two-dimensional being wandering around, you can never get to the edge, but you find yourself going back to the beginning, sooner or later. Now, there is no reason to think, in fact, some reasons to think the opposite, that there couldn't be, since space-time is uh, uh, a single entity rather than different entities for physicists, that there couldn't be a structure of space-time such that you have a kind of finitude in extent which is compatible with the complete absence of any boundary. However, there's supposed to be a boundary if you believe in a certain story of the Big Bang, but this boundary makes absolutely it gives absolutely no comfort to the person who thinks that God must have stepped in from outside because it simply does not take care of the simple recurrence problem. The recurrence problem is, okay, so God was there all along. You say, well, no, it wasn't all along because it was outside of space-time, right? Maybe there were laws of nature that existed outside of space-time, but were not personal. Dr. Craig wants us to believe that only a person could actually bridge the gap between, if you like, mathematics and reality. But there's absolutely no reason. That is simply a dogma. And indeed, it's a fundamental and well-known difficulty about those who believe that there is, if you like, a spiritual entity like the soul, that it leads to dualism, and that God would have had to also be physical in order to actually produce any effects in the world. Um, now, on the fine-tuning business, there is, here again, a very important fallacy. And I'm going to demonstrate this to you, if I can have a piece of chalk. I can make happen, in this room right now, I won't have time to actually do it, but I'm going to show you how I will do this, an event of arbitrarily large improbability, an event so improbable that to get where we are going, by chance, would be just as likely as to pick out, by chance, one elementary particle in the entire universe. It is estimated that there are about 10 to the power of 85 elementary particles in the universe. Now, there's more than 100 people here. If I go down the row and I ask you uh, for a digit between 0 and 9. 3. 3. 9. 9. 5. 7. 7. Okay. I'm going to do this for as many people as there are here. Let's say there are 200 people here. The resulting number on the board will be a number, the improbability of which is completely measurable. If you have 200 digits, it will be 1 over 10 to the power of 200. Compare that to the number of particles in the universe. 
The point is that the improbability of anything in particular is completely irrelevant unless you start out being able to predict or trying to predict. But we're here. Obviously we're here and the existence of each of you is incredibly improbable. Your father probably ejaculated a thousand times each time he would rise to 200 million spermatozoa, right? That's 200, that's 200 billion chances to one in the first place that the spermatozoa should encounter one of thousands of over and your mother, and that's just one generation. You can calculate that in just few, a few generations, you get something which is, in fact, just so super astronomically larger than this that it's totally impossible that any of you exists. That's what this argument proves. But you're here. So obviously the argument is fallacious. He's going to be asking questions to Dr. Souza. Um, Dr. Souza will have one minute to answer these questions for um, five minutes at the maximum. And then we're going to switch your roles. So. Okay. Let's first talk about my cosmological argument for the existence of God. With respect to the premise that the universe began to exist, um, I argued that the existence of an actually infinite number of things would uh, involve self-contradictions. And you said, but there is demonstrably an actual infinity of points uh, contained in any finite distance. Now, that presupposes that space-time is continuous, does it not? At least dense. Yes. All right. So that's, that's presupposing that. Um, isn't that, however, a disputed question? Fair enough. Okay. Um, <laughs> let's talk about the difference you raised between being boundless and being infinite. Certainly it's true that we can think of finite spatial surfaces, like the surface of a sphere, that has no boundary, but that it's finite. With respect to the past, however, um, Barring a circular time, which I don't know if you want to endorse, the, um, the fact that the past is finite would imply that it's bounded, would it not? If the past were finite, it would be bounded. How am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to answer the, each specific question, or am I supposed to let him go for five minutes and then... No, no, uh, your time is included, so... Just okay, so, uh, yeah, no, the, the point here is that... Uh, is that um, uh, there are, many, there are many possible alternatives. One is that the Big Bang is one of an infinity or a very large number of Big Bangs in a multiverse. As you know, that's one of the hypotheses that a lot of people take seriously. Right, but that, that's, that's crazy though it may seem. That's different from your point about boundlessness and infinity, isn't it? It is different. different. I, was only, I, was only point, I was only trying to point out that the argument as you stated it is fallacious because it rests on these dubious premises. I'm not saying that any of the, uh, uh, contradi the contradictories of the things you said are completely established, no. but all of them are entirely dubious. Well, but my difficulty is it seems to me here with respect to infinity and, and boundlessness that while these aren't synonymous, in the case of the past, if the past is demonstrated to be finite, then it would, be, it would follow that the universe came into being. It will follow that the universe came into being in a singularity, which is a, which is a, which is a situation in which none of the physical laws and rules apply, and therefore we can infer absolutely nothing. But remember that my point here was not so much that uh, you couldn't have a beginning of the universe, but that saying that God was then an explanation of this mystery. Yes, that was a different point. Vacuous. Yes, you said that's a vacuous explanation. Now, isn't it the case, however, that the arguments that I presented were deductive arguments, not inductive arguments? So that if the premises are true, the conclusion follows with logical necessity. But I completely reject the premise that only a personal being 
could possibly have given rise. Well, now that's shifting. That's a new point. That's a new point. Now let's talk about that. You said perhaps the laws outside of space-time could be the cause of the universe. Now laws of nature are abstract objects. These are propositions of a certain form, perhaps mathematically equated. Abstract objects as such don't stand in causal relations, do they? They stand in explanatory relations. But I'm talking about the other as the inference to the best explanation. So what we have to what we have to understand here is that there is, as an explanation, an event in which God acts. All right, good. But I'm talking about your alternative, where you appeal to laws. The laws themselves are abstract objects, and therefore can't cause anything. Laws are simply general descriptions of what happens in the world of a certain form. That's absolutely correct. Yes. All right. Let's go and talk about the fine-tuning argument then. You said any combination of numbers that the students might pick would result in an enormously improbable number. Correct? Now, suppose that the students were to each put a number on a piece of paper and lay it on their desk, and then we were to discover that they had enumerated in exact order, beginning with the first student through the 200th, the natural numbers from 1 to 200 in order. Wouldn't you suspect something was fishy? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. But the point is that ahead of time, we don't have any specifications. We are looking at the specification completely retroactively, and it's also retroactively that each of us can measure the probability of our own existence, and consequently, our own individual existence. Right. See, my time is up. All right. Thank you. Whoa. So, I always find that I, for one, enjoy the back-and-forth format. I think it's quite intense. If the participants are following that and the audience is fine, I think that's okay. I believe the intention was that the speaker would ask a single question, and then we would give the respondent a minute to respond. But I think this worked fine. Yeah, let's continue like that. Yeah. So let me ask, so, 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 because I thought you could do it this way. That's fine. No, my first question is on something that, that we haven't really debated yet, and that is the issue of objective value. Yes. I think that, I think that many people, when they think about objective value, make the mistake of thinking that an objective value is the only way in which you can have, as it were, a real value. And the contrast is with something that is merely subjective, and that does not have any reality. But I think that morality... Are you going to ask me a question? Yeah. Morality, I get five minutes. Morality can be relative, and yet not subjective. And morality is relative to human nature, to what we need, to what gives us pain and pleasure, and that is perfectly sufficient. You don't need absolute morality, and indeed, those people who believe in absolute morality are the ones that go around chopping other people's heads off. That's my question. Okay. Use your cross-exam time to add additional reputation. I think relative versus absolute is the false distinction here. It's the irrelevant distinction. The correct distinction that I drew in my first speech is between objective and subjective. I certainly do think that what is right or wrong is relative to circumstances and situations. In some circumstances, it would be wrong to kill a person. In other circumstances... That's relative to these people's situations, but it can be perfectly objective in the sense in which my response to something like this will be objectively my response, and if the response of most people is similar, it will be objectively true that people respond in this way. Oh, certainly, and that's a sociological fact, but that doesn't mean... That's sufficient. No, that doesn't mean that's the right thing to do or that that's the good thing to do. Relative versus absolute isn't the issue here. The issue is whether or not, for example, 
when National Socialist Germany decided it was good to round up Jews, gypsies, and homosexuals and throw them into concentration camps, was that the right thing to do? Was that a good thing to do, even though the majority of that society colluded in that kind of action? See, uh, you're, you're, you're trying to pin on me something that I don't have to, absolutely don't have to agree to. Because when, when I say that morality is relative to human nature, I'm perfectly happy to completely endorse that judgment in the name of what human beings are like, in the name of what people, what makes people thrive, what makes people happy. That's what matters. And the commandments that you find in the various scriptures and the various religion keep contradicting one another about whether it's good or bad to do this. Where do you get all these commands? Where do you get all this stuff? That, that is supposed to come from God. And why is it that in, res well, in respect of the things we now, agree on, the, the Greeks and the, the, Greeks and the Chinese <laughs> might have to do the same? Yeah, if I might answer the question, uh, that, Dr. D'Souza, at best, is an attack upon biblical revelation or, or other sorts of revelations. That's not an, an argument for atheism. That would just say that these scriptural accounts are flawed or something at very best. So that doesn't go to address either my moral argument or to establish atheism. That would be an attack simply upon claims to revelation. Given, given that your fourth and fifth arguments were made in terms of testimony to the resurrection yes. and linked it to testimony about Jesus Christ, yes. uh, I submit it's not irrelevant because uh, the God you're defending is the Christian God. It's not just any old God. And insofar as it's just any old God, uh, then it's meaningless because it's, you're simply arguing for something that all these sects supposedly have in common despite the fact that they continue to kill one another off or to claim that each of the others is doomed to hell. Yeah, so far as they do that, they're inconsistent with the teachings of Jesus. Jesus some of the teachings, some of the teachings of Jesus. It's, you said that I didn't do any textual analysis. I had 20 minutes. I gave you a couple of quotations. There are lots of quotations you can find from the Bible that say this, and lots of quotations that say exactly the opposite. And so at least that suggests that it can't be the consistent word of God, and that that's no, not no way whatsoever to be I am not arguing for biblical inerrancy or for the word of God or revelation. You don't have to believe in those things to believe uh, to be a Christian. Now, I, I, I don't want to back away from those thoughts, but they're not the subject of the debate tonight. All right, and that's fine. <laughs> well, I promised you it would be an elucidating and entertaining evening, didn't I? And I think that's certainly been true. Have we, first of all, seen tonight any good reasons to think that atheism is true, that there is no God? Well, I don't think we have. We saw first a parody of the ontological argument, which is not parallel. Remember, it's based on a logical incoherence, where, by contrast, the ontological argument says that if God's existence is even possible, then it follows that God exists. Secondly, we saw uh, an argument uh, based on evil and imperfection in the world, and I challenged Dr. D'Souza to show us what hidden assumptions or premises he is making that would serve to bring out the contradiction between God and evil. In fact, no atheist has ever been able to do this, so I'm confident he won't be able to identify those premises tonight. Thirdly, we saw a cluster of arguments, all of which commit the genetic fallacy, which say that because your belief originated a certain way, therefore that belief is false or unjustified, and we can discard those as simply fallacious. Then we saw a number of arguments about the biblical God uh, being evil. Remember I explained that God's commands are not arbitrary, as he alleged, because they are a reflection of God's necessarily good nature. Uh, I also suggested that in several cases he misused the scriptural examples, like Lot's daughter or with regard to slavery. The other cases were highly contingent and rooted in historical circumstances that were not meant to uh, establish general laws. Uh, and he hasn't responded to that yet. Finally, with regard to life being better as an atheist, remember I showed from Alan Brooks sociological studies and many others that in fact it is not true that secularists are more charitable, uh, more generous people than religious people, in fact quite the opposite. So when you think about all those arguments and ask yourself, do any of those prove that God doesn't exist? 
Well, the answer is clearly no. They may have some emotional force or rhetorical force, but none of them issue in the conclusion justifiably that therefore God does not exist. Now, what about my arguments? Did they fare any better? First of all, my argument based on the origin of the universe. Notice that Dr. D'Souza does not deny the premise that whatever begins to exist has a cause. Do we have good reason to think the universe began to exist? I think we do. First, philosophically, I showed that the idea of an actually infinite number of things leads to self-contradictions. He didn't deny the point, but he merely asserted that in a finite distance there is an infinite number of points. But under cross-examination, he admitted that he is assuming that that is a densely ordered series of points. In other words, he's begging the question. That is controversial, and I would argue that, in fact, there are not an infinite number of points in any finite distance. They're merely potentially infinite. And you cannot regard the past as potentially infinite because the past is not growing toward infinity in a backward direction. The past is infinite if the universe is beginningless. And so all the absurdities of the actual infinite would be entailed by an infinite past. Uh, as for the scientific arguments, the only response I saw was, well, maybe there are laws outside of space-time that cause the universe to come into being. That can't be the explanation, because scientific laws are just descriptions. They're abstract objects. They're propositions at best, and they don't stand in causal relations. You have to have an actual entity with causal powers which can bring the universe into being. Now, he asserts, but this is not explanatory to uh, call this God. Notice again, I have a deductive argument. If the two premises are true, the conclusion is inescapable. Whether you think it's explanatory or not, so long as those premises are true, and we've seen good evidence for both of them, the conclusion follows inescapably. And I think it isn't a characterless, characterless object that we've inferred to, I said, by the nature of the case. We infer to an uncaused, beginningless, timeless, spaceless, personal being of unfathomable power which created the universe. So this is definitely an explanatory entity. This is a personal, uncreated mind which brought the universe into being. The real reason Dr. D'Souza doesn't like it isn't because it's explan not explanatory, it's because it's theistic. It sounds like God. What about my argument from fine-tuning? I said there are, uh, the fine-tuning is explained either by physical necessity, chance, or design. I said it's not a result of physical necessity. He apparently agrees with that point. Could it be the result of, of chance? He says any number picked by the students in the audience here would be highly improbable. Yes, that is absolutely right. And that's why it is not merely the improbability that is at issue here. Rather, it is what theorists call specified complexity, where there is an independently given pattern and high improbability. It is the conjunction of high improbability with an independently given pattern that tips you off to design. And that is why, as he admitted under cross-examination, if you all enumerated in order the natural numbers from 1 to 200, even though that is no more improbable than any number you might pick, it is that specified complexity that would tip us off that that is not a chance result. That's design. It was collusion. And in exactly the same way, we know independently of our discovery of the initial conditions of the universe what conditions are requisite in order for intelligent life to exist. So this isn't a matter of uh, establishing the pattern after we know it. We know the requisite conditions for life independently of our knowledge of the Big Bang. It's just when we come to the Big Bang, voila, there we find those conditions met despite the enormous improbability. So I think that a far better explanation than chance is that this is the result of design. Um, what about the moral argument? I argue that if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Now, I really think that Dr. D'Souza agrees with that, but he wants to say, well, they're objective in the sense that this is really the way people would act. It's relative to human beings. But the point is that these values are the spin-offs of socio-biological evolution. And if you rewound the theory of, or the, the film of evolution and let it run again, very different creatures might have evolved with a very different set of values. And it would be purely arbitrary for us to say, well, our values are right and yours are wrong. These are just ingrained into us by socio-biological evolution. They have no objective validity. Stephen Pinker of Harvard University wrote in January of last year the following. 
The scientific outlook has taught us that some parts of our subjective experience are products of our biological makeup and have no objective counterpart in the world. The tastiness of fruit, the scariness of heights, the prettiness of flowers are features of our common nervous system. And if our species had evolved in a different ecosystem, or if we were missing a few genes, our reactions could go the other way. Now, if the distinction between right and wrong is also a product of brain wiring, why should we believe it is any more real? And if it is just a collective hallucination, how could we argue that evils like genocide and slavery are wrong for everyone rather than just distasteful for us? In fact, we couldn't argue that way because it would just be subjective. Richard Taylor is an eminent ethicist. This is what he writes. He says, the infanticide practiced by the Greeks of antiquity did not violate their customs. If we say it was nevertheless wrong, we are only saying it was forbidden by our ethical and legal rules. And the abominations practiced by the Nazis are forbidden by our rules and not obviously by theirs. So it seems to me that in the absence of God, there's simply no basis for objective right and wrong, objective moral values. But that contradicts what we apprehend in our moral experience. If you agree with me that what the Nazis did was wrong, that child molestation is really wrong, then you should agree with me, I think, that God exists. Fourth, the resurrection of Jesus. We didn't really talk about this in tonight's debate. Uh, the empty tomb, the appearances of Jesus after his death, the very origin of Christianity, are all firmly established facts by historians today. I know of no better explanation than the one that the original eyewitnesses gave, that God raised Jesus from the dead. And that entails that God exists. Finally, personal experience. Again, we haven't talked about this. I think that uh, on the basis of my personal experience, I'm justified in believing in God. Unless you can give me some reason to think I'm delusional, unless you can give me, say, some good argument for atheism, why am I not justified in believing in God on the basis of my personal experience of God? I wasn't raised in a Christian home or a church-going family. I became a Christian late in high school when I began to read the New Testament and experienced a kind of spiritual inner rebirth in which God became a living reality in my life. This is a reality that I've walked with now for over 35 years. And I think it's a reality that you too can find if you'll seek him with an open heart and an open mind. And so that's what I'd encourage you to do, to seek for God, to ask him if he's real, to ask him to meet with you. Uh, and I believe that it can change your life in the same way that it changed mine. Thank you. I haven't proved that God doesn't exist. No can you prove that the great spaghetti in the sky <laughs> no, no can you prove that uh, there isn't a lump of green cheese on the other side of Saturn. What we need to do when we think about what to believe is to think about what is likely and to think about what is reasonable. Religions of all kinds have believed in all kinds of different sorts of gods. And each one has given rise to deep experiences, often mystical experiences, certainly experiences of conviction, which are quite similar to the ones that Dr. Craig describes quite similar to one another, except insofar as each one proves the existence of a completely different, or at least a largely different, God, if you confine yourself to the Judeo-Christian Islamic tradition. It's largely different, but not completely different, because after all, they're all as well people of the book, as we said. Okay. So I think that the burden of proof here is indeed on the person who wants to show that there is a God and that that God is not just the unknown cause of the universe. Because before the unknown cause of the universe, I can only repeat this here, 
we can only stand in ignorant wonder. What I have against the theist is that the theist thinks that by saying, ah, it was God, this mystery, which is a real mystery, as many things used to be which are not longer mysteries, is a mystery that, in effect, the theist denies. Because the theist is not capable of saying, yes, I've no idea what has started. The theist thinks that by saying, oh, so it must have been God, that we've got an explanation. Now, I want to address the issue of the genetic fallacy. The genetic fallacy actually is not a fallacy. If you think about all the things that you know by observation, the issue of whether you are now looking at your hand, or whether you are merely dreaming that you are looking at your hand, or hallucinating that you are looking at your hand. <coughs> that issue, according to, I think, now practically standard views among epistemologists, is settled not by what good reasons you have, but entirely by the question of whether your belief is caused by the presence of your hand. Consequently, if it can be shown that your belief is caused by things, factors, that have nothing to do with the presence of your hand in front of your face, then you are not actually perceiving your hand even if your hand happens to be in front of your face, but is blocked by a hologram that looks exactly like it, and which is the real cause of your belief. So far from being a fallacy, the genetic approach to truth is actually the standard epistemological approach. And if the origin of a particular belief can be entirely accounted for without positing the truth of the thing you believe in, then I want to say, not that you've proved that it's not there, it might well be there, but that you have not established that it is there. So the burden of proof in this argument is actually an interesting thing to think about because when you're among believers, it's we atheists who have the burden of proof in what you might call the sociological sense. Because everybody else believes in God, and so how can you possibly deny it? And it's so obvious for everybody that they're in contact with God. They can feel it, they know it, they pray, and God responds. Yes, people do. People do these things, and schizophrenics do them alone, and Christians do them in numbers. And basically, Christians believe stuff which, if you're the only one to believe it, you get locked out as a schizophrenic, but if you can get enough people to believe it too, you get a tax deduction. <laughs> right? Exactly. Now, the, the, so the genetic fallacy is absolutely not a fallacy. Now, on the problem of evil, Dr. Pei challenges me to actually put out the argument. And I, I, I'm extremely puzzled, as puzzled as by his assertion that mathematicians don't accept the actual incident, uh, to which if I have time I'll return, but by the assertion that no one has ever made good on this argument. On the contrary, it seems to be the most powerful, and indeed, I think, a completely unanswerable argument against the existence of a certain kind of God. Come back to this in a minute, the certain kind of God. Only if you define God as being all-powerful so God can do anything, and all-benevolent so God only will allow or will do good things, and omniscient so that God actually knows how to bring about good or prevent evil. Now, those three things entail that if such a being exists, evil cannot exist. Now, I'm willing to go along with the idea that, yes, indeed, God exists. And what is really happening is that all evil is illusory. So when you think you're in agony, don't worry. 
Because since God is protecting you, you can't really be in agony because God would not allow that. Of course, if that's what's happening, then once you find out that this is the case, you never need to worry about being in pain anymore. I think that's implausible. It's not, I agree, a deductive proof, but I don't accept several of the premises. If we'd had a lot more time, we could have written these premises on the board, etc., that uh, Dr. Craig has asserted that I haven't addressed. And in this particular case, it seems to me that the argument is indeed cogent, and it's not claimed to be, it's not claimed to be deductive because it relies on the empirical premise that some things are bad. Now, when I say some things are bad, does that commit me to believing in objective value? I want to say I believe in objective value in the following sense. That given human beings as they are, some things promote their well-being and other things impede it. That's objectively true. And that is all that you can know. And if by objective you mean that it would be exactly the same if no human beings had ever existed in that far off gal galaxy where there are no conscious beings, then I say, of course not. Of course there's no objective value in that sense. And we don't need it. We do need to be kind to one another. We do need to understand as well as we can the ramifications of those complex, complex dispositions that we have, in fact, inherited from natural selection. And which have led people at different times to think different things are good or bad. But we're not in those times. It's completely, it's completely pointless to say, well, I disapprove of Greek slavery. You may say it, and you just mean, what do you mean? You mean if you would have been a Greek, you would have been against it? No, you wouldn't. Do you mean that if you had a Greek in front of you now, you would whip them? No, it doesn't. It's completely meaningless. Value can only be judged, as it were, on the spot, and that is because, indeed, there is no such thing as value that is completely independent of any human reality. Um, now, on chance, once again, and on laws, very quickly, it's true that a law is not a cause. But a law makes possible certain causal connections. And there is nothing in what Dr. Craig said that makes it logically impossible that there are deeper laws which are such that in what we call nothing, there could be the possibility of something coming about just by absolute chance. Thank you. Um, from my understanding of your position is that uh, the natural conditions that you mentioned that necessitate this both that can lead to human existence and the life that we see kind of places human existence itself on a pedestal and provides a privileged position of us as being the main purpose of our universe. Um, what I wanted to know is why is it not possible and probable that a different set of conditions could potentially lead to um, different living conditions that could eventually lead to a set of creations that pretty much don't need the set of criteria that we require, such as oxygen, such as water, yet they're just as functional and just as probable and just as valid creatures. Yeah. So going back, um, sorry, just also adding in the issue of the class, the whole number of things that um, Dr. D'Souza tried as an experiment, you're right, it, it would be very highly improbable for those numbers to eventually lead to the, the natural numbers that we, we depend on for our human and daily existence. But if this was this experiment was repeated enough times, why is it not possible that we could eventually lead to that number? And hypothetically, and we would come up with a number that although would not lead to us as human beings and exist, our existence as possible, 
It could, have, it could lead to creations that are just as probable. Although, again, it would not exclude us. It would exclude us, I apologize. So, two minutes left. Okay, there are a number of questions there combined into that uh, question. First of all, certainly you can try to have repeated numerous throws of the dice uh, or spins of the roulette wheel, and that will obviously increase your chances of getting the result. And this would be the proposal of having, for example, some sort of multiverse hypothesis or oscillating universe. The problem is uh, that those theories are physically untenable. Uh, the board guth vilenkin theorem that I mentioned in my opening speech applies to the multiverse as well and shows that it cannot be infinite in the past but must have a finite beginning so that it may well be the case that even if there were many repeated chances, they wouldn't be sufficient to generate uh, a universe that is finely tuned in the way that ours is. Now, don't misunderstand me. When I say fine-tuned or when theorists talk about fine-tuning, they're not saying that the purpose of the universe is humanity. That, that's not the point. The point is that the range of life-permitting values for intelligent life to exist anywhere in the cosmos uh, is so extraordinarily narrow that it, it is an improbability that is literally incomprehensible and in incalculable. Uh, so I'm not saying that we are the purpose of the universe uh, based on this argument, but rather that the best explanation for these values all falling into this range, even if that would mean there's intelligent life, as you imagine, somewhere else in the cosmos or somewhere later, that this is not the result of physical necessity. There's no necessity to be this way. It's not the result of chance, given the high improbability and the independent pattern. And so it seems to me that the best explanation is that this is a result of an intelligent planet. Uh, just one thing, which is that I, I don't accept uh, the, the, the idea that it cannot be a result of necessity for the simple reason that we don't know whether there could be meta-level laws uh, which would make it possible and indeed necessary that those, uh, that those uh, parameters should have just the range of um, uh, values that they do. Um, so, it, it, I, I, I think that that's a weak premise, although I think I don't need to rely on it, because I think it, it is perfectly, also perfectly possible that we're looking at pure chance. Okay. I, I, I guess this is probably an easy question. Um, I just want to ask, how is it possible to um, incite the existence of evil or the so-called evil actions of God to deny God's existence and yet deny the uh, existence of objective good and evil. That, yeah. so, so, I'm sorry, I didn't get that. Okay. How is it possible to incite the exi existence of evil or the so-called evil actions of God um, to deny God's existence and yet deny the existence of objective good and evil? So, uh, because, because to deny the existence of objective value is merely to deny that value is something that is what it is outside of the existence of beings capable of pleasure, pain, happiness, and misery. It is not to say that it isn't real. Just as to say that color is not, in some sense, in the surface of the object, is not to say that it isn't real. Color. Uh, that something looks red requires certain very, very specific combinations of reflectance in the object and patterns of processing in the cones in the retina. Similarly, that something is good or bad requires very special circumstances that have to do with the way human beings are constituted and the way in which the world impinges on them. So I'm just saying that things are indeed really bad, and that some of those things that are really bad must be imputed to God if you believe in God. Though the most obvious explanation for them 
uh, is just that it's the natural laws of the, the earth, you know, the tsunamis and the the tsunamis and the earthquakes and all these things in which people get uh, sucked into the most awful suffering, these are not the acts of God because there is no God. But if you think there is a God, then you've just got to impute it to that God. You can't get out of it. Thanks. Thank you. On Dr. Jesus's view, there aren't really objective moral values. What there are are things that either contribute or detract from human flourishing. And I think we could all agree with that. There are things that add to or detract from mosquito flourishing, for example. Uh, high humidity, warmth, and lots of blood will contribute to mosquito flourishing. What he cannot show is that we should morally promote human flourishing or that this is a moral obligation. Now, I think you're right about your point about evil. I think there's really an argument for the existence of God from evil, and it would go like this. Uh, if God does not exist, objective moral values do not exist. Two, evil exists. Some things are objectively evil. Three, therefore objective moral values exist. Four, therefore God exists. So paradoxically, although on a superficial level evil calls into question God's existence, on a deeper level it actually proves God's existence, since apart from God there would not be good and evil as such. I want to thank you both for your presentation, but I just had a quick question for you, Dr. Craig. Uh, yes. If uh, God created everything, then who created God? And if God created himself, then how did he create the mechanisms to create himself? Right. Um, on the argument that I give and on the standard theistic understanding of God, God is a metaphysically necessary being. That is to say, he exists beyond time and space, and therefore he doesn't have a cause. He is the first uncaused cause. Remember, the first premise of my argument was whatever begins to exist has a cause. Something cannot come into being without a cause. But uh, it's impossible for a timeless, uh, spaceless being to come into existence. So God simply exists uh, in, a, in an uncreated way. He is eternal, he's timeless, and uncaused. <coughs> Now, lest you think this is special pleading for God, I'd remind you that this is what the atheist has always said about the universe, that the universe is eternal and therefore uncaused. Matter and energy are eternal and never caused. But that's now become highly implausible in light of astrophysical cosmology. Uh, it points to a transcendent cause beyond the universe, which is eternal, timeless, and therefore uncreated. May I? Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, look, it, it may show that it was uncreated, but it certainly doesn't show that um, it's eternal, uh, with no evidence of that at all. And um, my, I think my principal uh, problem with this is not so much that I reject the argument, that, but that the argument appears to be completely irrelevant to any notion of God other than this unspeakable first cause. And there's absolutely no connection to any of the things that people want to think about God. Why the hell should we pray to this first cause? Why the hell should this first cause be concerned with us? Actually, it's pretty obvious that this first cause is not concerned with us. Look at the way things are going. Right? <laughs> Look at the weather today. <laughs> Evolution was random, based on chance. Then why is there a gap between the most intelligent species being us? So that as to pick the second most intelligent species species. The gap between us and the second most intelligent species is not that far. The, 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 uh, the, the more we come to learn about other primates, uh, you have, uh, um, right here at York, which is actually at the, other, at the other campus, you have one of the world's foremost specialists in orangutans. And if you talk to her and said that to her, she would just laugh at you. She has a whole series of examples of behavior in orangutans who are often not the ones cited as being the smartest of other primates that show that orangutans are capable of planning, they're ca capable of uh, understanding what other people want and tricking them, they're, ca they're capable of all kinds of things. 
But what does make the difference is, and I mean, this is what my book is about, uh, so you can buy and read it. <laughs> what does make a difference is language, which has established in human beings and no other species a type of reasoning, which is explicit reasoning, using language, using mathematics, which, although it is slow, clumsy, often mistaken, tremendously difficult to handle. And that's why we need computers who are good at handling it, because it's basically uh, 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 a matter of language and logic and mathematics. Uh, we need it in order to do things that only human beings do. We need it in order to get to the moon, to build computers and cars and planes. No other primate will have done that. But that's not because we're so much smarter. It's because our smarts has become, has become as well, multiplied by this amazing new power, which is the power of speech, which has evolved in human beings and not yet in others. Without wanting to make any sort of pronouncement on neo-Darwinian evolutionary theory, it seems to me Dr. D'Souza takes back with the right hand what he gives with the left. The fact that we are language users is an enormous difference between us and primates. And it's not just oral speech. I mean, it could be sign language or some other sort of graphic speech. The ability to, to manipulate linguistic Symbols to refer to things in the world to have intelligible patterns is an enormous difference between us and primates. And that's why our primate cousins scratch around in the dirt and pick insects off each other's backs while we fly to the moon, write in submarines, write symphonies and sonnets, and have universities. I mean, it's, it's ludicrous to suggest there isn't this enormous gap between us and the great apes. Yes. Well, we understand the law of cause and effect um, based on the doctor argument or based on the uh, experience of seeing things changing into one another. Uh, I don't think we understand the cause and effect as an a prior knowledge or, you know, as a, as a deductive knowledge of something else that we already knew. Um, well, my question is, how do we apply that knowledge to things coming into existence because we have, we have no prior experience of that. I'm not saying that we need to have a priori knowledge of this. I, I've never asserted that we have a priori knowledge of that premise. Uh, I'm perfectly happy to say that we know that a posteriori, that uh, based on our experience of the world, uh, we come to see that things do not come into being from nothing, that out of nothing, nothing comes. Nobody here tonight is worried that while we're listening to this debate, a horse may have popped into being out of nothing in your dorm room and is there defiling the carpet uh, right out of the seat. So uh, it seems to me that we have every reason to think that first premise is true. If things really could come into being out of nothing on cause, then it becomes inexplicable why just anything and everything doesn't come into being out of nothing. Why doesn't root beer and Beethoven and hot dogs come into being out of nothing. You can't say that only things of a certain nature come into being from nothing, because nothingness has no nature to constrain it. Nothingness has no properties. So it seems to me if, if any premise is obvious in this whole debate tonight, it would be this one, that whatever begins to exist has a cause. I disagree. <laughs> It's surprising as it may sound. And it is possible to say that only a special kind of thing can arise out of nothing. Physicists have looked at vacuums, that is to say, they have tried to produce conditions under which there is absolutely not one single detectable particle. And they have found that, as a matter of fact, particles pop into existence. Now, a horse is not going to pop into existence in a vacuum. 
Because everything that now exists is the result of five or ten billion years of change, evolution, and growing complexity. Consequently, when we're talking about the beginning of the universe, we might be talking precisely about those slight, those slight oscillations in the vacuum that produce out of nothing and in a completely random way, they actually produce a particle. Once you've got a particle or two, right, then you're on your way. Okay. Um, based on the assertion that you don't need an immaterial, self-existing, and personal being to explain things, how do you account for the universe? Either it is an illusion, either it is self-created, either it is self-existing, or the being, which he argues is God, self-created um, it. Which one do you um, believe in? I find the presupposition of your question a strange one. I'm not a genius, and I'm not all-knowing. There's lots of things I don't understand. I don't understand, I don't even understand how a radio works. <laughs> I don't even understand, I don't understand how, how, how uh, uh, fMRI uh, works. I'm completely baffled indeed by gravity and by nearly everything in the world around me. I acknowledge my ignorance. A thousand years ago, I would have said about lightning, about this, about that, I would have said, yes, it's the god of lightning, Zeus did this, and, uh, and uh, you know, that flood, that's due to, that's due to Poseidon, and, uh, you know, I got an explanation for everything. But the point is, we don't have an explanation for these things. And to say that God is an explanation is just a jump into something that then has no way whatsoever of being connected with what people actually believe in, real people believe in, when they say they believe in God. You have to then go to the testimony of people who saw the resurrection of Christ. But, for Christ's sake, there, are, there, there is an enormous amount of testimony for the resurrection of at least two dozen other beings in other religions, in the Middle East, in China, all over the place. When I try to explain to my Chinese wife these bizarre doctrines of the Christian faith about the Immaculate Conception, which presupposes original sin, about the virgin birth, she said, oh, yeah, we have lots of virgin birth uh, in, in Chinese mythology. Mythology is full of the same sorts of stories. You happen to be at the right place at the right time to pick up this one story. But the same story has been sort of told all over the place before Christ and <coughs> independently of Christ because it's just a projection of the human mind. I just want to know which of the four. Which of the four I said no, because I don't know. Aren't I allowed not to know? Um, I'm saying you should know or think you know. With respect to the resurrection, the New Testament documents are not mythological documents. These are not of the literary genre of myth. These are of the genre of ancient biography. They are like the lives of the Caesars and other ancient personages. We have four of these biographies of Jesus, and historians have agreed on those three facts that I mentioned. With respect to the question, however, I think the questioner raises a very good issue. This is one that has puzzled me for years. It seems to me we basically have three alternatives. Either the universe has existed from an infinite past, or the universe has existed only finitely long, but popped into being uncaused out of nothing. Or the universe has existed for finitely long, and there is a transcendent cause of the universe. Now, of those three, it seems to me that the third is the most reasonable. The idea that it's finite in the past and popped into being from nothing, I think, is clearly absurd. I think the problem of the infinite past involves the problems that I suggested. And therefore, I think the best explanation is that there's a transcendent cause. Thank you very much, both of you, for a wonderful debate. Um, uh, the, my question is obviously directed at uh, Professor Craig. Um, 
I personally hail from an Islamic background, and according to my religion, or at least my particular sex of religion, um, you're a heretic. And so if you're right. an infidel, you're going to burn in hell because you don't believe in the same thing that Right, I'm aware. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 but the point of my question is that within the trio of these you know, Judeo-Christian religions, yes. you know, according to this religion, this guy's going to hell. According to that religion, this guy's going to hell. Given all the diversity and all the death and destruction that's been caused as a result of worshiping God and all the you know, different sects of each different religion, wouldn't it, wouldn't it have been much more, isn't it more plausible to say that, in fact, God is a man-made creation specific to the culture of uh, a particular group of people, may they be Arabs in the desert, or may they be you know, Christian, or may they be Jews in ancient Rome, or you know, uh, enslaved people in, 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 in Egypt? Um, I don't see how that follows at all. I mean, I would like to see a good argument for that. Uh, I think only the only thing that follows from religious diversity is that they can't all be right. Um, they could all be wrong, but they can't all be right. But atheism doesn't win by default. You see, atheism is one of the world religions too. It's also a religious worldview which says there is no God, and it could be wrong. It could be that Christianity is true, and that atheism and Buddhism and Hinduism are wrong, or it could be that Hinduism is true and atheism and Christianity and Judaism is wrong. You see, atheism is in the mix, too, of religious diversity. The, the uh, an atheist doesn't get to stand back and play this game of saying, oh, you, you all disagree. He disagrees as well. He thinks 90% of the world's population are more or all mistaken. Now, with regard to Islam, Islam was my uh, side area of specialization during my theological studies in Germany, and I never dreamt that it would be something that would be relevant someday to uh, public uh, speaking of this nature, but with the rise in Western consciousness now of Islam, I found myself called upon to address it more often. And I think my fundamental problem with Islam is that the Quran gets it wrong about the historical Jesus. I think it's an enormous embarrassment for the Islamic faith that it denies the central fact about Jesus of Nazareth that every historian, even the most radical skeptical biblical critics admit, and that is that Jesus of Nazareth perished on a Roman cross uh, under Pontius Pilate. He was, he was crucified and died. And the Quran, as you know, says they did not kill him, neither did they crucify him. Uh, so. I think that when you look at the Quran, it was written by a man 600 years after the life of Jesus with no first-hand knowledge of the facts, and that's why no historian turns to the Quran as a primary source of knowledge or information about the historical Jesus. Uh, and therefore, I don't think it is God's word. I, I think it is a product of later uh, religious genius, but uh, in fact, it, it's, it's mistaken in several of its assertions. <laughs> Uh, I don't know much to say. I, I agree with the question, uh, uh, but um, I do. I do want to object to the idea that uh, atheism is uh, just another religion, uh, except insofar as uh, atheists agree with the one thing that every religion gets right, which is that all the others are wrong. <laughs> <laughs>
Satan is the one who is responsible for the evil and the good. And Satan has power over the waves because Jesus caught the waves when they were going to be swamped. So, um, um, if, 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 I'm, if I'm following your question, um, um, I, I, I want to say that um, I don't see that saying that God sent you proves anything. And lots of people have uh, consented to being martyred. Um, basically, you could think of Jesus Christ as a sort of proto-suicide bomber, wouldn't you? He's somebody who got himself martyred for what he regarded as a good cause. What is this good cause? This good cause turns out to be to redeem all us poor buggers who were created by God and immediately tricked into being eternally damned. What kind of a story is it? We get tricked into being eternally damned by being placed in this place, in, in this garden where, where the very idea of wanting to know something uh, condemns you and all your descendants to such an, to such an extent that God himself has to turn around and say, well, okay, then I'm going to punish myself. Well, he should have not done it in the first place if he had to punish himself so hard for doing it. I think the story is just unbelievably absurd. And of course, it is absurd, and many people believe it. We are absurdum because it is absurd, because they think, well, so many people have believed this, and it is absurd, it's got to be true. I think that is just plain absurd. It's, it's more absurd than most of the Greek stories about the gods. It's more absurd than most of the Hindu stories about the gods. At least you can understand their motivation. But the motivation of God for this whole theory of creation followed by media damnation, followed by some sort of repentance on the part of God. Fuck it, why didn't he get it right the first time? <laughs> I personally find the, 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 the story, the creation story in the Bible to be wonderful. It's a story of redemption. It's a story of a, a father's love. Uh, that he has created us to know him, the source of infinite goodness and love forever. But we have rebelled against him. We've turned our backs on him. Uh, uh, we rejoice when his name is reviled and blasphemed. Uh, we want nothing to do with him, and yet he loves us, and he sent his son into the world to redeem us. And if we will receive that redemption, it's a free gift. It's, it's up to us. We can claim it uh, freely just by accepting it. I once had a debate with an atheist at the University of Massachusetts. She made a telling comment in her final speech. She said, you know, one of the problems with atheism is there's no redemption. Uh, once you've done something wrong, there's no redemption for it. And I thought, wow, that is really an incredible difference between the gospel story and atheism, because on the gospel story, it is a story of redemption. Next question for Dr. Craig. Uh, Dr. Craig, uh, my topic of the question is Molinism versus Calvinism. Uh, uh, say, say slowly, please. Molinism versus Calvinism. All right, so this isn't on the debate tonight. Kind of. Okay. It was interesting when Dr. just his definition about the child being born outside. I, I need you to articulate more clearly for me to understand your question. Okay. If God would allow suffering or even death of one to save two people, does not that mean he chose the two people to be saved? And that wouldn't be an all-loving God instead of predestined God. I, I don't understand the question. I'm sorry. So if God would save, God would allow suffering of one, would God allow the suffering of one, one person to save the two people to save two people for greater good? For but greater. doesn't that mean that um, God isn't all loving and that He predestined some people to be saved instead of another? Well, on the Molinist view of predest, I guess I should explain to people what Molinism is. Molinism is a theory of divine providence which says that God knows what every person would freely do in any set of circumstances He places that person in. Uh, so on the Molinist view, predestination is not incompatible with free will. Uh, God just knows what you would do uh, if you were in those situations. But it's, it's up to you to freely do whatever you want. And in every situation you are in, God wills that you choose the good. 
and that you do the right thing. He will permit you to sin. He will permit you to do evil, but he does not want you to do that. You do that despite his will and in defiance of his will. But he will permit it, and he will only do so with a morally sufficient reason for it. Namely, knowing that ultimately some good will come out of it, that's, or in some way his ends will be achieved. So, for example, uh, the illustration you gave, perhaps he allows a person to suffer knowing that uh, two people will find eternal life and go to heaven because of that. Um, and so that would be a morally sufficient reason for allowing that person's suffering. And God will, of course, recompense that person for what he suffered, too. The Bible says that the uh, brief, temporary suffering that we experience in this life is not even worth comparing to the weight of glory that God will bestow upon his children in heaven, so that anyone in heaven looking back on this lifetime would say, I would go through it a million, million times over to know this happiness and this joy. The longer we are in heaven, the more the sufferings of this life shrink by comparison to an infinitesimal moment. Uh, so, yeah, I, I don't see any problem with what you suggested, and it doesn't mean that God doesn't love that person, not at all. Uh, it just means that God is sovereign, and uh, he has the uh, ability to dispose history as he wills, so long as he respects the freedom of uh, human persons. No, I'll skip this one. Uh, next question. Dr. D'Souza, your example of how something can come into existence out of nothing involving quantum vacuum, isn't it the case that quantum vacuum in fact have properties and therefore they must exist because that anything that has properties has to exist? That seems to be a necessary truth. And therefore, it's not a very good example of something coming into existence out of nothing. Rather, it's something coming into existence out of something. My point of is Thank you. <laughs> My point about the, uh, the uh, possibility that, that... My point about the possibility of um, something coming out of nothing was linked to my remark about the possibility of a meta-level physical law that allowed for physical laws to develop into what they now are, but that were in some significant way different before the Big Bang. Okay? My point is simply that, once again, I'm not claiming to have the answers. The theists are the one claiming to have the answers. I'm pleading for the recognition of our ignorance, because in the history of science, the only thing Starting from Plato's remark to Mino, the only thing that could possibly lead you to actually get a good explanation is to start off by admitting that you don't know. And religious people keep saying that actually they do know. And what they say, according to me, is essentially meaningless. I'm merely asking for the legitimacy of not knowing and being both curious and full of wonder to be recognized as an equally valid attitude to life. And that's the one respect in which I think that yes, an atheist can be religious in some sense, and that is simply to have a sense of awe before the universe without jumping to some sort of explanatory conclusion. I am so grateful that you asked that question, because when Dr. D'Souza was saying that uh, quantum fluctuations are an example of something coming from nothing, I was over here biting my tongue, wanting to speak out. Of course, curiosity and wonder is an appropriate attitude, but that is no justification for pseudoscience. And that's what it is when you're talking about the vacuum is nothingness. The vacuum is a physical entity with a rich physical substructure. It is a sea of fluctuating energy governed by physical laws. Uh, it is not an example of things coming into being out of nothing. And when Dr. D'Souza says, well, maybe there are deeper level laws that show there's some possibility in nothingness for things to originate, that is, that is pseudoscience. That is, uh, 
It's just utterly empty. I think it is so ironic that when people think there's a conflict between science and religion, they declare another uh, victory in the battle between science and religion and jump on the bandwagon of science. But when science starts confirming religious beliefs, like in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, all of a sudden they jump off the bandwagon of science and start deserting contemporary science in favor of these pseudo-scientific uh, hypotheses. Uh, well, I guess the <coughs> my question is still around. Uh, uh, if I understood you sort of correctly, I went back and forth. Uh, you claim that with God and religion, that uh, somehow people are, that there is a sense of morality that you just track out, uh, that God kind of imparts to them. If I may interrupt, that was not my argument. Well, my argument was not about where the sense of morality comes from. My argument concerns whether or not moral values are real and objective, not whether we have a moral sense that requires God uh, to give us that sense. Uh, okay, well, that perhaps I missed it a little bit, but I'll ask the question I lost. Uh, how do you account for a statistical drop in violent crime, meanwhile, with a rise in atheism and, sorry, a decline in uh, church going attendance? I'm not a sociologist, I'm a philosopher. I, I'm not qualified to answer that. I'm not making any claim that religion uh, is something that's going to benefit society and therefore we should believe in it or something of that sort. That, that would be patently fallacious. So that's just not germane to the debate tonight. Well, I'm going to cheat here and just say one thing about the previous remark. <laughs> um, I did not uh, claim that uh, in appealing to uh, quantum fluctuations in the vacuum, I was giving any explanation or a scientific explanation. I was drawing on this as a possible analogy for a possibility that we can recognize. And what I've been emphasizing is that I don't know. Not that I have an explanation. You're the one who thinks you have an explanation. You're the one who's positing some answer which I deem to be vacuous. I posit no answer. And so you're quite right to deem my explanations vacuous because they are non-existent. I think we should recognize that we can't explain everything. Uh, Dr. Kasuba, um, during your presentation, you, uh, one of the arguments we're making is that the reason we don't, well, the reason we don't need religion is that we have rational, scientific, and things in the world. For instance, you gave the example of what we need to do to the God. We don't need various gods and more because these can be explained uh, primarily. I think your influence was through evolutionary theory. If I'm wrong, please correct me, but that's what I thought you were implying. I'm just curious if you have any opinion at all on the position then of what's known as evolutionary theism. No. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Would you like me to clarify? Uh, yeah. 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 Uh, it's the position that God essentially created the universe through the process of Darwin, of, um, Darwin and evolution. Oh, okay. Um, for okay, 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 that's what you mean. Yes, I have a position, that I have a position on it. If that's what God did, well, that just really confirms that he's a vicious bully, the nastiest character in the whole of literature. What kind of character would create a world in which he just, he just contemplates through millions and millions of years just animals tearing one another apart, uh, uh, evolution devising the most awful tortures for organisms of various kinds, and so on and so forth. If that's what you think God did, then I definitely think that he's a vicious bully. What you're talking about is not evolutionary theism, you mean theistic evolution. You've got the words uh, reversed. Um, and I think that, again, it would be the burden of proof would be on Dr. D'Souza to show that God could have, not have morally sufficient reasons for creating a world in which a natural world is brought about through an evolutionary process. Um, it could well be that this is the means by which God would create an ecosystem that would have a balance uh, in it 
that would be a habitable place for humanity where this whole human drama then is played out and provides an arena for free agents to uh, choose for or against God, to develop moral maturity and, and so forth. And it seems to me that that would be um, a justifiable explanation for why he might do such a thing as you imagine. Dr. You'll have to speak louder. In the there are many misreading as well. There are many what? Mysteries. 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 Mysteries.
defend your position that God does not exist when you are making a claim of the nature of God? I simply mean that if there is a God, he's not the one you're describing. He is instead a vicious bully. <laughs> now, since that's not the God that you believe in, then the God you believe in does not exist. Now, I also happen to think that an evil bully God does not exist either, because all of these horrible things that happen are simply results of the nature of things. They don't require an intentional agent. They don't require to be intended to be done on purpose. And most things in life, let me return to this point which I made earlier, most things in life actually do not mean anything. They don't result from any intention. They don't actually result from any kind of reason. Dr. D'Souza seems to have the view that on Christianity that God causes all of the evil and suffering in the world. And that's simply not the case. Uh, the idea is that these things can happen for purely natural reasons. As he said, the fire that warms you can burn you. The water that you sustain or sustains you can drown you. Um, but the point is that on the theistic view, God has morally sufficient reasons for permitting the evil and suffering in the world. And if Dr. D'Souza is to carry his argument for atheism, he needs to show that God cannot have morally sufficient reasons for allowing the bad things that happen in the world to happen. And that is to shoulder a burden of proof which is so enormous that it goes far beyond the sort of explanations that he accuses me of having. He has a modesty, he says, when it comes to these explanations, but that modesty vanishes when it comes to his own skepticism about whether God has morally sufficient reasons for the evil in the world. I don't see how he can prove that that's impossible or even improbable. Okay, final question for Dr. Craig. Okay. Um, yeah, I was, I was kind of lost. I wanted to be on the other side, but I was kind of in line on So I'm going to ask the question to both of you, and um, yeah, I'm just going to make a comment to that. Um, I think it was a very fruitful debate, and I think that both of you um, really helped out uh, to remind everybody here. But like one of the questions that I was really on my mind was to say that do you both agree uh, that it cannot be scientifically proven that God exists? or it cannot be scientifically proven that God cannot exist. It's just a simple question that we as yeah, humans can't answer. I, I, yeah, I, well wait a minute, what was that last part? <laughs> it's, just, it's just simple that we as humans can't answer that question. Oh, that doesn't follow from the fact that it can't be scientifically proven. I was all ready to agree with you that there's no scientific proof for the existence of God. But, Behind your last comment sticks the assumption that if something can't be scientifically proven, that therefore it cannot be known or it can't be justified. And that's false. That is to presuppose a theory of knowledge which says that science is the only arbiter of truth. And that's simply wrong. Moral values cannot be scientifically proven. You can't prove moral values. You can't find them in a test tube. Aesthetics is not susceptible to the scientific method. Mathematics and logic cannot be scientifically proven. Quite the contrary, science presupposes mathematics and logic. You can't prove the, ex the existence of the external world scientifically. You can't prove the reality of the past scientifically. There's all kinds of beliefs that we all hold, that are rational to hold, that are not amenable or susceptible to scientific proof. So don't fall into this trap of, of, of scientism that sometimes permeates our culture, thinking that the only arbiter and way to know truth is through science. That will leave you with a skepticism that would be virtually unlivable. So while I'm quite happy to say there's no scientific proof of God's existence, nevertheless, I think that the arguments that I defended tonight are good philosophical arguments for God's existence. They are logically valid. They are based on premises that I believe to be true. And those premises are more plausible than their negations. And therefore, I think these are good arguments for God's existence. That doesn't mean they're compelling. It doesn't mean they're 
They will convince you against your will, but I think it does mean if you're willing to look at them with an open mind and an open heart, they are sufficient to justify belief in God. I almost agree with all of that, <laughs> except that in that last bit, I think that it is indeed possible to say what is not scientifically proved, but the most reasonable thing to conclude from all the evidence and reasoning one can apply to it, and that is that no God such as has been talked about or defined today, having both the attributes of being at the origin of the world and at the origin of ethics and at the, uh, at the beck and call of human beings to some extent, that no such God exists. Final question in the I guess, um, how do you convince people who share your views of atheism, uh, for example, nihilist, Marxist, fascist, nationalistic uh, factions, but not necessarily share your views of humanistic optimism to do good, like goodness in your own definition? You're asking, how can the people who agree with me about some things disagree about others? Yes, uh, particularly with uh, the views of atheism, for example, like cultural Christians who uh, Normally, are Christians, but they really do not practice Christianity, they're not devout, and they help to more selfish kind of appetite to it. I'm sorry, I still didn't really get the question. I, I, are you asking? Are you asking the question? Are you asking the question about how how can atheists be bad people? Given you know, my views, how do you convince uh, someone who's uh, from your worldview, from their own worldview, who also uh, believes that there is no God, or who really doesn't? Uh, think to highlight the question whether God doesn't exist and uh, to, to do basically uh, good Well, so how can I argue about morality without bringing in God? Is that what you're asking? How, how could I convince someone that my moral views are the right ones how without... One atheist, wait, how can one atheist convince one atheist to do good, basically, um, if your own definition of good is different from the other atheist's definition of good? Yes. Because there's no reference for what's what. Well, I, I don't think that that differentiates he is from anybody else, right? I mean, uh, 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 how can a Christian con convince uh, 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 an Islamic fundamentalist who thinks that it's a good thing to uh, um, explode himself and kill civilians that it's not a good idea? Uh, I think that the fact that there are disagreements about one range of things doesn't really have any bearing on the fact that uh, you can disagree about some things and agree about other things. And it's often very difficult to convince people of anything uh, about this. I doubt very much whether anybody today, tonight, actually changed their minds. It's one of the mysteries of this whole subject, and that is that most people hold their beliefs in this area, despite the fact that we try and come up with arguments one way or the other, but most of us hold these beliefs regardless of what arguments we can think of. And very seldom do we actually change our minds. It's very difficult for people to be convinced that it's wrong to do something or that it's right to do it. Think about Think about, for example, the way in which uh, one atheist might try and convince another atheist that uh, uh, she should become a vegetarian. Right? The argument might be quite complicated, it might be quite convoluted, it doesn't have anything to do with the, just with the good of humans, it has to do with other sentient beings, and you have to convince the other person that that other sentient being also matters. And these things are possible, and some of these conversations sometimes do change our minds. That's the power of language. It's fairly feeble compared to our, in, to, uh, to our intuitions and our emotions, but it's not completely useless, or we wouldn't be here. <laughs>